there's a meme that goes around and it's like that the universe wakes you up and gives you lessons. And at first, like it's a feather and then it's like a rock and then it's like a bus. You know what I mean? Like I always have to wait for the bus to hit me before I'm like, Oh, I got to change that. Okay. Got it. You know what I mean? Like I would love to get it when the feather is like, hello, like you might, you need to get this. So I just decided to embrace it. I was like, this is the best thing that ever happened to you. And I was like, you're going to learn teamwork. You're going to learn humility. You're going to learn to sweep. You're going to learn to finish what you start. You're going to learn the consequences of your actions. You're going to take responsibility. You're not going to go to jail. You're going to embrace this. This is the response. This is the consequences of your actions. Stop feeling fucking sorry for yourself. And, you know, I started posting it on Facebook too. Like everyone else was like embarrassed and they were like, mm. like, okay, I'll be your friend on Facebook, but like I'm pretending I'm on a work trip. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amy, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Of course. It. Welcome to Arion Talks. <laughs> thank you for having me, Antonio. I, I really love your story and I love how you say it because you're one of the very few people, especially now online with social media, everybody showing their, their true selves online. You're one of the very few people that actually is real, raw, and you tell the story without any BS and... Um, with details that are very vulnerable. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that that's what we need in the world right now. I think all that curated bullshit is unhelpful, makes people feel like they're less than, they're doing it wrong. They're not as beautiful. They're more fucked up. I think it creates a lot of separation and loneliness. And especially during the pandemic when we're all feeling really alone anyway, I think it's really important. I don't know what I noticed was, that like the pile of shoes in the background that just shows you it's like still still just still don't have it totally together right eight years sober and just like still kind of uh. um i'll have to point that out because it's like i was gonna move it and i was like oh fuck it right <laughs> fuck you want it. reality look there it is there's reality a pile of shoes and nine thousand jackets when you live in la and it's 80 degrees every day it's like everyone's like what is wrong with you um i don't have the best filter which so, I think is good. Yeah. I mean, it can be not terrific always at dinner parties <laughs> or social situations. People are like, don't say that, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. um, I think it made for an authentic, really raw book that helped a lot of people. And I think that I just, it's kind of who I am. Maybe it's brain damage. I really don't know. I've always, I sort of <laughs> always been like that. And then after I had like, developed epilepsy from crystal meth and cracked my head open. It just became worse. Um, but I also noticed that my secrets and what I'm ashamed of or what I'm going through or my depression or my feelings are not unique at all. Like if you have the balls to put them out there, everyone identifies, which yeah. is like, you know what I mean? Like we're all really much more similar than we think. So it's like, you know, to think that your secrets are so unique is so, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's really kind of, you know, uh, pretentious and narcissistic. I mean, we're all really similar. We all want to be loved. We all have fear. We all, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like all the same stuff. And it's like, so just speaking the, you know, I just was like, I'm going to say the thing that everyone's thinking that no one dares say. And people are just like, fucking thank you. Like, <laughs> oh my God. I mean, yeah. it's not getting me laid at all. I'll be <laughs> honest with you. Like even the book, people are like, oh, like, like she's my icon, but like, I don't want to like, I don't want to like marry her. <laughs> she seems crazy, but it's like, I don't care. I feel like it's my job having survived what I survived to pass it on and be, you know, tell the truth. Yeah. Who's going to tell the truth if I don't do it? I mean, everyone has to tell, I mean, everyone's got their own truth and it's like, I don't know. Those people have more followers, the people who curate their stuff and <laughs> always look at, you know, filtered and everything's beautiful and happy. But um, that's not reality, is it? I don't know. No, it's I know a lot of those people and I'm like, that's fucking bullshit. That's not your life. <laughs> you know? No, it's definitely. Like you're selling a dream. It's like weird. It's definitely not. And I would love to really dive into your story for some of my listeners that might not know it. Maybe starting from the beginning, Beverly Hills just... A brief, a brief synapse so people get an idea of what you've been through and what you've learned through the process. 
Okay. So I grew up in Beverly Hills. I'm the only daughter of a screenwriter and a, and a designer. Um, I grew up, you know, you know, pretty wealthy, but not super wealthy, like upper middle class. Like, um, but I didn't want for anything. I went to private schools. I got everything I wanted. I was pretty spoiled. Um, I was a real good girl, really pure. Hmm. Mm, Like didn't like, you know, didn't mess around with boys or smoke or drink or anything, drugs until I was 19. I was like, I think I kissed someone for the first time at 18. I was really like, wow. like a straight A student and like really like a good girl. And, uh, and then sort of, you know, showed up in college and everyone was like, what a weirdo. Like, <laughs> and I was like, uh oh, like I thought it was cool. I was like, look, I'm so pure. And everyone's like, what a freak. And I was like, oh shit. So, you know, I kind of, you know, lost my virginity and started drinking and, um, it wasn't really out of control right away. I mean, I think what was out of control right away was that I was depressed around 15. I started to have really bad depression at 15. And then by 19, I had a nervous breakdown already. And then I also developed like an an eating disorder. Mm. So like I was anorexic and bulimic from 19 to 25. So already I was starting to kind of unravel, you know, um, and have problems with compulsive behavior and depression and psychiatric issues and stuff like that. And so then, uh, uh, I graduated still magna cum laude, did really well in college and then got out of college and really without that structure just was like, now what? <laughs> like completely unraveled. That's when I really like got fired from every job I've ever had for like being like crying or drinking on the job or whatever, or taking too many days off or, um, just really, really started to, to go downhill and spiral and just had no purpose and really didn't know how to sort of take care of myself at all and that's the thing when you're sort of the broken person in your family the drug addict or the or the mentally ill person everyone hovers around and takes care of you and then then you don't know how to take care of yourself so then you also learn to like that well i'm broken that's my role i'm fucked up and everyone's going to take care of me Mm. and you become very entitled you don't want to do anything for yourself because everyone's going to do it for you until they don't yeah. and then you're dropped on your ass like i was at 42 with like not knowing how to do anything and it was like a gnarly rude awakening i was like oh shit you know at 42 i should you know i didn't know how to do things that i should have known in my 20s it's really really immature and like so uh, i moved to san francisco just was like experimenting and trying to find myself and you know, all that LA crap and, uh, you know, right. <laughs> find, try, find, find myself, yeah. uh, which is like something that only like rich kids say, right. Like yeah. everyone else is like working a job. Like, um, I went to San Francisco and I just was like, Oh, you know, I started, I think it was a rebellion against all my purity from before. And I started doing experimenting with drugs and I found crystal meth and that's the drug that clicked for me. And it was like, I didn't really know anything about drugs or addiction. I'd always been really, you know, I hadn't been around it and it just made me feel normal for the hmm. first time in my life. And it felt like the psychiatric medication that I needed. I was like, why aren't the psychiatrists giving me this? Like, this is what I need. And it's like, well, now I know why, cause that shit <laughs> fucks your life up. It makes you crazy and ruins your brain. But, uh, at the time it was what I needed. And then later I found out that my mother and my, um, uncle had both been addicted to amphetamines. So it was completely in my, in my biology, like that, that was the drug of choice. My mom was also recovering, is also a recovering alcoholic. She had been, a, um, but she took amphetamines when she was a model. Sorry. That's like, is that you or me? Annoying thing outside. That's outside. Sorry. Okay. Don't worry. Um, so yeah, it was crystal met. And then that just began a 20 year battle with addiction and seven rehabs and years of sobriety. And then I would relapse and then years of sobriety and relapse, seven rehabs, four psych wards, three suicide attempts, uh, got into shooting cocaine. Um, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse, which is what addiction does. Hmm. Um, the last relapse was, so that was sort of my life. Yeah. While everyone else was like, you know, being a lawyer or raising a family or getting married, I was just, you know, going in and out of rehabs and psych wards and trying to get, you know, and writing. 
So I was like, so I have like a zillion pieces of books that I've written when I was high. I was like, oh, those are, I can't even look at those. I'm just like, you know. Um, so you think everything you write when you're high is terrific. And then you look back, you're like, ooh. Um, you know, so uh, things really turned around. Uh, the last relapse was on Oxycontin. They'd given it to me for a shoulder injury. And I was married at the time. I married someone to take care of me. So that's my fucking deal. I was like, I can't take care of myself. And there's guys like, I love you. And I'm like, okay, let's get married. Like, and I thought he would take care of me and fix me. I was always looking for someone to fix me from the outside. And like news flash, like no one can fix you. Like you have to fix you. Like you are responsible. Like no matter what you inherit in terms of trauma or biology or what happens to you, like you can choose to stay the victim, but eventually you're, it's your responsibility to fix it. No one can fix it for you. But, uh, we got into an altercation on Christmas of 2011 and um, I pulled a knife on him. I was high on Oxycontin and God knows what else drunk. And I pulled a knife on him and I threatened to stab him and he called the cops on me and I was arrested for felony domestic violence and I went to jail. And yeah, my That's parents were really... That. <laughs> my parents were really no i kept drinking after that because that's an alcoholic you just you drink after you're like oh my god like i went to jail like i ruined my life go 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 you know <laughs> yeah. my i you know like my ex hates me my lawyer sucked the police suck go 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 you know um but i lost everything when i was left penniless in a psych ward by my ex-husband i went to a couple more treatment centers relapsed a bunch of times uh and then what kept what kept you going back like what were you running away from going back to crystal meth or alcohol or... i didn't go back i never okay once i developed i was living in paris and i developed seizure disorder at five years clean and wow. once i developed epilepsy they were like the doctor was like did you do a lot of drugs <laughs> and i was like fuck <laughs> So I have all my teeth and that's kind of what matters when you live in LA. And <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm on medication for epilepsy for the rest of my life. I've lost my license twice. I've cracked my head open. I've got, I've broken teeth. I've gotten stitches in my face. I've like, it's a, you know, I have grand mal seizures, so it's pretty bad. Um, I never went back to crystal meth again. I never touched again. I was terrified of it, but shooting Coke, Coke was natural. So that was a whole different deal. You know what I mean? But I would shoot Coke and I'd have a seizure. And instead of going like, I should really, really get clean. I would shoot Coke wearing a bike helmet. So I didn't crack Damn. my head open. And that my friends is alcoholism. Like how do I get high and not have the consequences? So it got really bad. I was pretty gnarly. Uh, So the big turnaround point was when I was sentenced to 240 hours of community labor, which is like sweeping the streets, right? And uh, a year of domestic violence counseling. And uh, I was in sober living for two and a half years and uh, at 42, just with nothing. How's sober living like? What do you have to, how's sober living like? Like, do you have specific restrictions? Yeah, sober living is sort of like, it's like the step down from, from residential rehab, but before like you live in real life, like mm -hmm. by yourself. So it's like, you're living with other sober people, there's a curfew, they can drug test you, you need to sign in and out where you're going, there's mandatory groups, that kind of stuff, mm. you know, but you can still like work or you know, yeah. do, you know, community labor like I had to, so you don't go to jail. So, um, uh, yeah, I was there for two and a half years. I didn't really, I was scared to leave and I also had nowhere else to go because mm. my parents were over it at that point. I drained them financially and emotionally and everyone was just like, God, we are so over your shit. <laughs> oh, we're over it. We're over it. We're over it. Like, Um, and so I remember going to community labor and I was still kind of entitled and bratty hmm. and, uh, you know, I was like, Oh my God, like every, these guys are criminals. Like I'm a Jewish American princess. Like, what am I doing here? And it was like 40 like Hispanic guys with like hoodies. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> and they're like, what you be for weather? Hmm? I was the only girl. They're like, uh, they're like, 
I'm here for a DUI. What you here for? And I was like, um, I, I'm here for felony domestic violence with a deadly weapon. They were like, oh, shit. You know, so like total crazy weta. You know what I mean? They were like, fucking that bitch is crazy. So I was sweeping the streets. I realized I was a criminal. I had more time than anyone else. I was the only one there for assault. I'm like, you're the criminal, dumb shit. So I was like, oh, shit. So my whole world flipped. Everything I had judged, I became... And um, everyone knew we were criminals when we were sweeping the streets. We had these little outfits on and everyone was like, ew. It was just, it was really humbling. It's really fucking humbling. And I ran into a couple people I knew and that was horrible. <laughs> it was just horrible. You know, it was just like, you know, that I had like dated from like 12 step from years before. And they're like on their way to a meeting in a, in a suit and I'm in like a, tan dickies it says clean team on the back with like a broom and with my sweat pouring down my face and like a garbage bag of leaves i was like hi me again <laughs> just an eternal fuck up you know <laughs> um and i had an epiphany sweeping the streets and i went first i was like ah, oh, my lawyer sucked and like fuck them and fuck my aunt you know and felt you know total victim stuff and then i went wait a second this could be the best thing that ever happened to you. Or it could be the worst thing that ever happened to you. And it's your decision. I was like, this possibly is the big crossroads of your life. You know, maybe this is the best thing that ever happened to you dressed up as like the shittiest thing. Like this might be what you need. Like this isn't an accident. You've been a fuck up for 20 years. Like this is the consequences of your actions. Can we learn things? Is there stuff to learn? What if we embrace this? What if we made it fun? What if we, there are lessons here. The universe, you know, I love, there's a, there's a meme that goes around and it's like that the universe wakes you up and gives you lessons. And at first, like it's a feather and then it's like a rock and then it's like a bus, you know what I mean? Like I always have to wait for the bus to hit me before I'm like, Oh, I got to change that. Okay. Got it. You know what I mean? Like I would love to get it when the feather is like, hello, like you might, you need to get this. So I just decided to embrace it. I was like, this is the best thing that ever happened to you. And I was like, you're going to learn teamwork. You're going to learn humility. You're going to learn to sweep. You're going to learn to finish what you start. You're going to learn the consequences of your actions. You're going to take responsibility. You're not going to go to jail. You're going to embrace this. This is the response. This is the consequences of your actions. Stop feeling fucking sorry for yourself. And, you know, I started posting it on Facebook too. Like everyone else was like embarrassed and they were like, mm. like, okay, I'll be your friend on Facebook. But like, I'm pretending I'm on a work trip. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I, you know, and I was really like, Hey, I got arrested and I'm sweeping poo on Hollywood Boulevard. Like, what's up guys. And people were like, they were and every day. I would talk about like what I learned, you know, I was eating chicharrones and like today I did this and today we learned this and today I, you know, whatever was painted over graffiti. And like, I found this on the ground and like whatever I learned. And, um, I was just open with it and people were like cheering me on and they loved the, the, the posts and they were just like, you're the fucking best. Like, this is hilarious. And like living through my life, you know, and like having it as a story and seeing the humor in it helped me also and not sh like hiding it, hmm. I think too. You know, um, and people like when I finished, when I graduated and finished all my hours, people were like, get arrested again. That was amazing. Oh, my God. I was like, no, I'm not going to get arrested again. But um, that's when my editor w uh, for a magazine I was writing for was like, that's your book, dumb, dumb shit. That's your book. And I was like, oh, because I didn't know how I'd always wanted to write a book, but what, how do you write a book of 20 years of relapses? Like how boring is that book? Yeah. Just like yeah. I got sober and then I relapsed and then I got sober and then I relapsed and then I got sober and then I relapsed. And people are like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, well, I mean, editors love a narrative arc and I didn't have a narrative arc until that point. I didn't have, where I had changed. Mm -hmm. I had just been in this cycle of Groundhog's Day doing the same shit over and over and over again. And every time it looked like I was going to get my shit together. Yeah. You know, there was a period I had seven years clean and, st and then ate it, you know? And so this was the big change. This changed me. And um, I've been sober since. Congrats. 
And Thank you. Essentially, what did you find out in this last this last time around that you didn't notice the previous times before? Was there like a, a root cause that you identified or or what was it? Um I wasn't really interested in figuring out why I used mm. or whatever. Um, I, for me, I had been in enough therapy and analysis and I knew everything. Hmm. You know, my own mom was unavailable and she abandoned me and my dad and I were in, like, I knew everything. Hmm. Um, I am in 12 step and I had a sponsor and he just said, you know, you don't have to be a good person. You just have to act like one. Nobody knows the difference. Hmm. And I was like, ew, that seems really phony and weird. And he goes, Every, you're judging yourself on your intentions, but the world is judging you on your actions. Hmm. No one gives a fuck about how you feel, Amy. And I went, like a light bulb went off. All my other things, I had been doing everything by the way I, f- I feel like it. I don't feel like it. I got to use. I'm uncomfortable. Like, I don't want to work out. I don't doubt it. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. And this time I went, Fuck your feelings. Act like the person you want to be. And I did that with everything. And uh, it was really hard. It's like cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was just like, you know, and what happens when you take contrary action like that over and over and over again is you create a new neural pathway in your brain that eventually becomes your default mechanism. Yeah. And so it was like, eventually I became the person that I was pretending to be. And so what I did learn this time was to not listen to my feelings because feelings are fleeting yeah. and feelings aren't necessarily like they're valid, but they're not necessarily true either. Especially when you have mental illness or addiction, they can be really blown out of proportion. You know what I mean? Which is why it's so important to sort of like take a pause because like my first reactions are always really hot, you know? And so if I take a pause and go, Hey, maybe we don't say that right away. Or we just think about it. And like, and then I kind of kind of calm down. Um, my father had said to me, you know, I was waiting to feel ready hmm. to start. We- and you, if you, yeah, if you wait, you fucking wait forever, man. You yeah. never feel ready. That's the thing I realized. It's like you get, feel ready by doing it. You know, my father had said to me, you know, discipline creates stability. Stability doesn't create discipline. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. What are you fucking <laughs> talking about? And he was just like, he goes, a disciplined routine life of doing the things that you need to do will give you that feeling of stability that you're looking for. You're doing it backwards. You're waiting for the feeling of stability before you can do those things. And I went, Oh, so I started to just take the action and it changed everything because no one feels like writing a book. No one feels like exercising. No one feels like, you know, none of it. I mean, I quit vaping and smoking during the pandemic. Fucking every day I want to fucking vape and smoke. Every goddamn day I pass a fuck. I see someone vaping or smoking. I see it on TV. I see the jewel and I'm like, you know, it's like, and I go, hey, not today, bitch. Like, we don't do that. You know, I'm over eight years clean. Um, Yeah, we're talking about procrastination. It's like, I really need to be held accountable by other people. So my dad can be kind of hold me accountable for like writing. And I have a romance coach now because I'm like horrible in relationships and pick like, like the biggest assholes ever. Like people who are like, I'm not interested. I just want to fuck you. And I'm not interested in a relationship and I don't like relationships and haven't had one in 17 years. I'm like, I love you, (laughs) you know, challenge accepted. Like I just pick the worst people ever. So taking a time out on that and working on myself and my self-esteem and my picker. And, uh, you know, I have a a coach, uh, I mean, I have a a trainer and like, I just have to like literally make a date with him every time, like tomorrow at two and I'll go, I don't feel like I'm having a bad day. He's like, I don't give a fuck. And I was like, there you go. Like, if you know, I had to teach my romantic coach to do that. She goes, why do you think you're having resistance to meditating? And I go, that's not going to work with me. <laughs> you got to meditate. I will dance around it. I, I'll give you so many intellectual. I said, that's not going to work with me. What works with me is I don't give a fuck if you feel resistant. Do it anyway. Yeah. And, and text me after. And that's a great model for life. It's like we are waiting to feel ready or to feel like we want to do something when in reality, we just need to start doing it and then we'll feel mm-hmm. it. I, I, I love that. I love that. 
So th- this was essentially like you realizing that you had a you had it backwards the whole time, and then you started implementing this new ideology that that they told you about, and things started to get a lot better. And now talk to me a yes. little bit about your book and how that has impacted other people, and what what are you planning to do now? Um, I just wanted to write the most honest book I could. And I really was just like, maybe it'll help someone, you know? I mean, there's not many women who are perpetrators of domestic violence and (laughs) IV drug addicts and sex addicts and crazy and, you know what I mean? And been in psych wards, but come from privilege, you know what I mean? Like all that stuff. And I've always had a lot of insight, even when I was young, which made everything really painful because I knew what I was doing. And I saw it all. I saw through my own bullshit. I knew I was a drug addict really early. I wasn't like in denial. I was like, oh, I'm a drug addict. Like I always saw it, which makes, you know, the insight is helpful when you're a writer, but it makes life really painful when you're like seeing yourself doing stupid shit and you can't stop. Uh, The book, I get notes every day of people just going, oh my God, like, thank you. Thank you for writing the truth. Thank you for writing what addiction is really like. Thank you for making me laugh at stuff that I was fucking humiliated about. Like, thank you for talking about sex addiction. Thank you for, you know, making me feel less alone and less ashamed and giving me hope. Like you were such an epic fuck up. Like you got sober. Like maybe I can get sober. Like, like, holy shit. Like you're so fucking resilient. Like, I mean, they make me cry. I screenshot them all and save them all. It's been the most beautiful, incredible experience. And like, I didn't give a fuck about other people when I was, you know, before. And now my whole life is how do I help people? Like, that's all I give a shit about. How do I give someone what it took me 20 years to learn? You know, Um, so they don't have to suffer the way that I did, you know, um, and I feel I, mean, I, I shouldn't be, I should be alive. I really shouldn't be alive. I should be dead. And that's obvious. So it's like, I mean, if you read the story, it's like, everyone's like, how's that bitch alive? And how does she look that young when she's fucking 185? So, um, it's given people really a lot of hope. It's opened up speaking experience, uh, speaking, uh, opportunities for me and uh it was optioned as to be a tv series and we're working on a second option that one fell through it's hollywood you know the script wasn't right it's you know it's hollywood and then covid came um i'm working on a second book i earned out my advance which only 10 percent of authors in the world cool. ever do it took four and a half years but i fucking did it i was like bitch you will do this like now <laughs> i'm a hard worker like before i was like i don't feel like it and now i'm like you know what you get out whatever you put in whether it's a sobriety or working out or writing, whatever it is, like, you know, it's just as easy to do a good job as it is to do a shitty job. And I just realized, you know, and I still fight being lazy. That's my nature is just being a lazy piece of shit. And it's like, so I was like, I really, really worked on, um, just fucking putting everything into it, like working hard. Because that's, you know, it, no one's going to give it to you. Yeah. No one's going to drop down and just give it to you. Everyone's like, oh my God, you're so lucky. I'm like, I'm not lucky. I've worked my ass off. I wrote for a zillion magazines. I did, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, it's like everyone thinks it's like they see the tip of the iceberg of the success, they don't see the years that I tried to sell a book or the years of me writing for magazines or the years of whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And essentially you were writing while you were doing all those other things. Have you ever like, yeah, I was writing for magazines. I was writing for magazines the whole time about all my, all my experiences. And a lot of those got put right into the book. So it was great. Cause it made it really easy versus this time where I haven't really been writing for magazines cause it's been COVID and my mom got dementia and my dad got cancer And that really kind of threw me and I had to sort of focus on taking care of them and handling all their stuff. And, um, so this book is, you know, I don't have it. Like I can't just grab pieces of an art of articles and just like puzzle it together. I've got to write it all from scratch. And also there's so much pressure because everyone loved my fair junkie so much. So it's like, you know, like, how do I compare? How do I compete with my first book? It's like, and it's different. 
because it's not, a, it doesn't have all the crazy stories, you know, because I'm sober. So this is life in sobriety, which no one's written a book about. Everyone <laughs> thinks like, you know, everyone on like social media is like, I got sober and it's just rainbows and like unicorns. It's magic. It's like bullshit. It's magic. Like my whole fucking, like I got my heart broken. My, de- my, my parents both got ill. Like I was never poor. You know what I mean? Um, and people are like, you're an icon. And I'm like, do you guys take food stamps? Like it was fucking gnarly. You know what I mean? It was like, I also had, you know, I have a criminal record. I had financial wreckage. I didn't know I was, you know, I'm 51 years old and I don't know how to do anything. You know, I I just was like shot out of this bubble of drug addiction into the world. And they're like, you know, I went to have my, my oil change. I tell the story all the time. And they said, how long has it been since you changed your oil? And I said, Mm, like seven years the guy like healed the fuck over he was like oh my god no one's taught me how to do any of that i don't know how to do taxes i don't know how to do i don't know how to do anything i'm a i don't know how to cook i'm a horrible cleaner my house is disgusting like i don't know how to do anything i know how to do drugs i know how to <laughs> score i know how to make a fucking crack bong out of a mountain dew bottle i know how to fucking manipulate people like i know you know that kind of shit. I don't know adulting shit. And adulting at middle age when you're the social security payee and power of attorney for your mom, it's a very fucked up mix of stuff. And it's funny. You have to find it funny because otherwise it's just humiliating. So it's going to be kind of like, what's life like in sobriety? Because no one's written that. Everyone writes the addiction memoir because it's all gnarly and arrests and blah, blah. And it's like, I have flashbacks that I haven't used. I have crazy stories that didn't make it in the first book or I forgot about. But it's going to be about life and sobriety and navigating it. And if you have mental illness, you still have mental illness. Fuck. (laughs) You know what I mean? And it's like harder because you can't numb out. And like real life hits and things hurt. And you can't escape. You've got no, like I nap a lot. That's my escape. I'm like, okay, can't deal. (laughs) Laying down, you know, like just like that's it. So it's going to be talking about that and dealing with all that lost time too. that a lot of addicts that deal with, which is like, oh my God, if I, what if Hmm. like, well, that's not helpful. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. I'd be in a different place if I hadn't been a drug addict for 20 years. Can't change the past though. <laughs> so. No, but it, you know, it, 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 I, 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 I got to take that fucking all that shit and make it into a book that helped people. And that's pretty dope. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm like, that's kind of cool. So at least I, at least it was, it was, it made it, I made it into something helpful. So it doesn't feel like lost time because yeah. if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't be where I am now and I wouldn't have done what I've done. So I don't know. I mean, that's very much Russell Brand's thing. He's like, we're all addicted to something. I think that, um, I think there's a spectrum of addiction. I think some people are sort of over here and people like me are over all the way here where like, I can't smoke one. If I smoke one, if I take a puff of one cigarette, I'm chain smoking. That's Mm -hmm. it. It's like, it's a fucking nightmare. It's a, I can't do anything. Um, I think that, um, so I can't speak for other people. I only know my own biology, which is very, very obsessive and compulsive and addictive. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that if you could look at it, workaholism, there's things that are accepted. You know, I think people have gotten really addicted to the internet. Yeah, for sure. Gaming has become a problem. You know, some people have had a problem with porn. Shopping is a big problem. I mean, we're the fattest nation in the world. Eating is definitely a problem. Food addiction, food addiction is a big problem. Um, you know, I think that love addiction is a real thing, sex and love addiction, but it's been sort of like incorporated into the culture. Like you get high off fucking relationships. Like someone pays attention to you and you literally get like a fucking dopamine rush. And it's like, and then you're just, you know, you're, you're obsessed with the next person or 
you know, and it's like, I mean, I think that, uh, it comes from childhood trauma and, but, but we've, we've, you know, it's in every movie, like, I'll wait for you forever, <laughs> you know, that yeah. kind of shit. And it's yeah. like, or it's in every song, like, I can't live without you. You know mm. what I mean? Like, you know, like it's in every song. It's part of our culture, sex and love addiction. Yeah. Especially yeah. love addiction. Like it's uh, the romance and the soulmates and the fucking like, you know, but that shit's taken me out. I've tried to kill myself over relationships. I've relapsed over relationships. That stuff rips, just destroys me. And so that's why I've taken a time out from all that stuff. And, yeah. um, but it's hard because it's like food. You have to learn to, to, to moderate. With drugs and alcohol, you can stay abstinent. But with like, I mean, I haven't, you know, I've been celibate for like four and a half years. I got my heart so shattered and I was so fucked up about it. And I was so, so and I've just taken time. Also just like work, you know, and I was like, I'm going to focus on me. Like Lady Gaga says, you're not going to wake up one day and your fucking career is not going to love you anymore. And I was like, yeah, bitch. You know, so it was like, you know, I also told you, like, I wanted to pick better people. So I just kind of, it's very also, it's very alcoholic to go from one extreme to another, to go from being a sex addict to being celibate. You know what I mean? It's like from going to, you know, being a crack smoker to being vegan. We're like extremists. <laughs> we love the extremes. We're not good at the moderation. And so moderating food and moderating relationships with sex and love is really, really hard. So essentially because you have to interact with it. So you have to fucking grapple with that. Wherein I can just stay away from drugs, alcohol, and nicotine. And it's easier than trying to manage it. For sure. Do you think that um people who are more prone to who have addictive personalities like have these extremes like they're either doing something 100 percent or they're not doing something at all like if you're a person Correct. like that should should you be watching out with uh like absolutely. what you do essentially absolutely absolutely that's me i'm meditating every day or i'm not meditating at all if i miss one day it's over i'm either working out every day like a maniac or i don't even know where the fucking gym is like it's like that's totally me completely me you know fucking everyone or not fucking anyone Hmm. It's like, it's a fucking nightmare. So to, for me, it's like, that's why for us, it's really routine and structure, no matter how you feel is really important. And, you know, I struggle with it. It's something I really struggle with. So, you know, but I think that, yeah, I think that for people like us, you know, like I'm either in work mode and I'm like, fucking, uh, <laughs> you know, Or I'm just like fucking just totally just like, I'm going to get a massage and like hang out with my friends and like, you know what I mean? Well, so I'm like, I'm writing my book. No one bother me. Like, ugh, like in this, like it's, I, I tend to work in spurts. That's kind of my thing. I'm like, I'll fucking work, 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 work. And then I fucking, you know, and I also have really bad mood swings. Like, so it's like, it's really difficult to sort of ride that wave, you know, and my father doesn't have that. He doesn't understand. So he's just like, Write it, you know, right through it. <laughs> writing is the answer, you know, put, you know, filter, you know, funnel it in your writing. I'm like, oh, God. And <laughs> there's times when you have, you know, really, really gnarly clinical depression that you just, you just can't. You know, everyone's like, you'll feel better if you take a walk. It's like, well, sometimes you just can't even fucking get out of bed. Like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm cool if I don't fucking kill myself today. Then I'm okay. If I don't use or kill myself today or call some fucking jackass to come over, like I'm, I'm good. You know, uh, sometimes you have to just lower the bar and have some grace and compassion for yourself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't I think we tend to be really, really hard on ourselves and be perfectionists. And so if we can't do it perfectly, we're not going to do it at all. And it's like, just do it a little bit. Yeah. You can't, you know, you don't want to do a full work, like do 10 minutes, do 20 minutes, whether that's work or meditation or exercise. You know what I mean? Well, if I can't do the whole thing, I'm not going to do any of it. Yeah, we should strive for that middle ground, for that balance. Yeah. And how how have you managed to like deal with this addictive ten tendencies of yours in order to try to find a little bit more balance? I have a lot of support. You know, I have a sponsor. I'm in 12-step. Like I told you, I have a trainer. 
I have a fucking uh, romantic coach. Um, I'm really honest with all my friends. Like I need a lot. I'm letting other people help guide me and raise me. And I really need other people to hold me accountable. I've broken my own promises to myself so often. I don't trust myself anymore. And I know that's kind of sad to say, but it's like, I can't go, well, I promised myself and keep it. Like, I'd love to have that kind of integrity, but I can't tell you how many times I said I'm never going to do this again and did it again. So I don't trust myself. So I need to bookend. I need to tell someone I'm going to do this and I need to fucking text them when I'm done. I mean, that seems quite childlike, but you know, it's, I need to, I, I really actually need that accountability. And so I, I know that. And so I do it. No, and that's good. Like I essentially do that myself also. Like when you have a big project or something like in my culture, everybody's like, oh, you shouldn't say anything because if it doesn't happen, then everybody knows. But I take the opposite approach where I tell people and then if I don't do it, they're going to hold me accountable. It's like, oh, what happened to this thing you're working on right. or what happened to this? So I feel like outsourcing that accountability really helps for sure. Yeah. Like I don't like I need deadlines without deadlines. Nothing gets done. Like, I don't have a deadline for the proposal, and I'm just kind of like, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, working on a little. It's also really painful. It opens with a breakup, and I just, like, cried and cried. Like, you know, I mean, it's a heavy. It, the book is, you know, some of the stuff I'm going to write about, I, you know. Writing a book's hard. That's why people don't do it. It's yeah. fucking hard. And writing about painful shit is really hard, too, because you have to relive it. Everyone's like, is it cathartic? It's like, I don't find it necessarily cathartic at all. I find it really triggering and painful to relive that stuff. Um, and also, you know, sometimes you have insight into it once, but you need space from it to have that kind of insight and to have humor about it. Otherwise, you just sort of just like, oh, it's so painful. Um, and the approach you take but, is uh, like authenticity and humor. And that's how you've managed to sort of pull this story through right? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be in the second book too. I mean, I have a style that's my style. That's my writing style. So it's like, that's not going to go away. It's just a different era of my life with different stuff that's happening. You know what I mean? Um, and I know people want the crazy stories. So it's like, well, what am I thinking? Like, well, what like sex addiction stories got fucking, can I put in as a flashback? And like, <laughs> what crazy drug stories can I put in? And I'm like, you know what I mean? People, you know, but it's like, I also really want to talk about just like living life on life's terms because it's been really that's a fucking ride and just like you know asking for help i asked for help yeah you know i don't fucking know i need a new microwave like which is a good one and i'm like okay who, who do i ask okay my lesbian neighbor is amazing with fucking you know appliances and she's really good with like finding stuff and i'm gonna fucking ask her like i you know you go to people who are good at stuff Like I have a friend who helps me with my taxes. You go to the, you know, the people who are experts at stuff and go help me with this. Like literally we went to go get an upgrade on the iPhone and she was, it's still on my friends. I mean, I'm still, I mean, this is embarrassing, but when I got divorced, when I, when I, when we're going through the divorce, my ex-husband said, if you don't get your fucking phone off my line in three days, it's going to be disconnected. And I had horrible, horrible credit. Because I've been a drug addict and been de dependent on everyone. You know what I mean? I never built my credit. I didn't care. No one, everyone took care of me. They just threw money into my account. Like I didn't, I had nothing. So I didn't know anything. So she just put it on her account. And it's been on her account for fucking like 10 years. <laughs> right? And now I'm like, well, and now, but, and I still, there's still a part of me that loves for people to do shit for me. Like I went over to her house and she goes, bring some laundry if you want. And I brought over like all my laundry and this bitch did all my laundry. I'm like everyone's like, how do you, you're so disgusting. You get people to do things for you. You're such a lazy piece of sh entitled princess piece of shit. And it's like, um, so we went to go upgrade the phone and the guy was explaining like the different plans. I have 153 IQ. Okay. I'm not dumb. I literally, I mean, I'm stupider than I used to be for sure. because I've done all these drugs and I've had a lot of seizures. <laughs> Definitely dumber than I used to be. Literally my eyes just glazed over. And I was like, and I said to the guy and my friend was like listening and she, she was like, uh-huh. Okay. So we can have this plan or we can upgrade to the 12 pro. Right. And I went, I don't really understand. Like, 
I'm sorry, I do a lot of drugs, so I'm kind of stupid now. My friend was like, go sit down, like, shut up, and go sit down, it's embarrassing. Like, literally, I was just like, reverted into some weird child and like, went and got like, a case. I'm like, look, it's glittery. And my friend was like, sit the fuck down, Amy. Like, let me deal with it. Like, and it's like, you know, okay, for that, I don't really get it. And I let her handle it. But then also the other day, like, I had to change my windshield wipers and I fucking ordered which ones they were. And I'm a Jew and we're not great at like mechanical shit, like in general, like I'm not, except when I was a tweaker and I used to take apart radios and stuff like that. (laughs) And I was like, I will do this. I'm like, you're not stupid. You can figure this out. And I went outside and I labeled which one was the driver's side and which one is the passenger side. And I followed the directions. And I changed my windshield wipers. And I can't even fucking tell you how proud I was of myself. I was like, yeah! I was like, you're so silly. But it was a big deal to me, you know? I didn't just go to, like, pet boys and go, like, I don't know how to do this. Can you help me? You know? I did it myself. You should have seen people were stopping in the street, like, look at this bitch with her mask on and the box is just, like, trying to figure it out they were like is this is she gonna, does she need help do we, do we help her is she gonna figure it out i was like you should have seen me i was like was well, this one like it was really funny but i did it so i think there's some things that yeah you do on your own but i also don't think we're meant to be solo at everything like i'd love to have a partner i'd love to get married again and like you know that we're you know we're not meant to you don't have to be great at everything no one's an expert at everything so For it's sure. like it's okay to have people help you for sure and especially like when you you're in situations like uh maybe the ones you were like everybody was willing to help you the point that they didn't help you that's when you realize but now that you're back to normal it's okay to have help again and especially yeah in certain things yeah not you know yeah and then uh, and then i mean it's still a thing i fight where it's like you know to be the boss you know now so i'm realizing like i don't need other people's approval like if you don't like it fuck you like i mm-hmm. uh, you know like learning my own thing but it's like i think that part of the the fear of making my own decisions without like polling all my friends like that's something i do which is like well what do you think and what do you think and what do you think and what and everyone's like oh you know what i mean like fucking <laughs> just but you know it's like trusting myself but it's like if it's a bad decision then i fucked up And I, so, but if I, if I pull people, then I feel like, then I want to have to take the responsibility for a bad decision. I mean, my sponsor said to me, I will never give you advice because if I'm right, you will fucking be dependent on me and worship me. And if I'm wrong, you will uh, blame me. And he's right. And life's like a, a contradiction. Like we need to have accountability and at the same time, know when to ask for help. So that's what Correct. it's a balance. Yeah. It's learning that balance. Totally. For sure. And so it's, it's, it can be hard. I can be very rebellious and be like, fuck you. You know, don't tell me what to do. And I can be like, please help me do this. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, I have to have hand surgery and I'm going to be fucked for a month, you know, on my right hand, uh, in a sling, in a splint for a month. I'm going to need a lot of help. And thank God I'm a pro at asking for help. <laughs> People are like, don't you feel embarrassed? I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, I can teach anyone how to ask for help and not feel embarrassed and be entitled and get people to do things for you. So I have to fight that urge and do things for myself. That, you know? Mm-hmm. That's great, Amy. Uh, Amy. I think we got a lot of great insights from our conversation. Definitely accountability, balance, knowing when to ask for help. Is is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to promote specifically? We had Hunter Biden on our podcast today. So check it out. Just pretty cool. We're a pretty cool get. Uh, I have a podcast that I started during the pandemic because like what else was I gonna fucking do? Uh, <laughs> with a social worker. It's called Rehab Confidential. Um, and it's we talk to politicians and celebrities and harm reductionists, and it's all and scientists and doctors and it's not just recovery it's sort of everything and we are very inclusive like if you want to smoke pot and that works for you cool and we talk about ibogaine and we're trying to get on an expert to do ayahuasca and ketamine therapy and like 
we're re, you know like really really open to stuff and um uh so that's been really really interesting and then um I guess, yeah, with Hunter Biden was like a cool catch for us. And like a lot of people are, I'm waiting for all the haters. So I can't wait. <laughs> um, uh, I have a lot of fun with that. We're really irreverent and we kind of banter for the first 20 minutes and then we have a guest on and it's always, you know, someone interesting. And I've learned a lot about that. And then, uh, you know, my book, My Fair Junkie, like buy it, you know, there's Audible. It's me and my husky, weird, manly voice, uh, you know, uh, narrating it. It is uh, funny and dark, and uh, it, it's on it's on Audible, it's on paperback, it's on Kindle, it's on hardcover. Uh, you can find it used. You can find it on eBay, unfortunately, because it came out in 2017. But if you <laughs> want to support a starving writer, then buy it new. <laughs> no, thank, thank you for everything. And what do you think about psychedelics and when it comes to addiction and overcoming addiction through like well, we had a guy, or... an ibogaine. We had an ibogaine expert guy come on, and um, you know, I think it seems to help really a lot with um, opiates. That seems to be the big thing that it helps with. Um, I have epilepsy, so it would never be a good yeah. thing for me. Like, there's a lot of things that aren't like I can't do transcranial magnetic therapy because I have epilepsy. Like that, my you know, I really took myself out of the game for a lot of things like stem cell therapy and all kinds of stuff. And it's like, um, I'm open to whatever fucking helps you. You know yeah. what I mean? Like people are dying. So I'm not like some fundamentalist, like, no, like that's not sober. It's like, there's a whole <laughs> part of a uh, 12 step that is 12 step plus psychedelics. And you know, the founder of, of AA did psychedelics the whole the rest of his life when he was sober. Um, I liked mushrooms. I've never done acid. I felt like I would have like a break and like be weird and fry the rice and never be the same. You know what I mean? It scared me. Like, I don't know. Just like, I don't like hallucinating. I don't like morphine. Um, but I'm, I support everything. I think now we're looking at ketamine and microdosing and all kinds of stuff for depression. And like, if I got to a place where my depression was super, super gnarly, I'd absolutely be open to that. And my sponsor is like fucking super progressive. That's cool. Yeah. I think whatever helps. I think we really need to be open. I think everyone's addiction is different. Everyone's biology is different. Everyone's trauma is different. And I think that we need to really be inclusive and just like whatever works for you is cool. Instead of being like, it has to be abstinence or it has to be this or it has to be 12 step or it has to be yoga with goats or what the fuck else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, hey, whatever works for you, cool. Like, I would love to be able to moderate. I would love to be able to have one glass of wine. I cannot do it. I've done that experiment 900 times. 900 times. I get naked and violent. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I got the message. <laughs> Just don't have the biology for it. And, like, people are, like, you know, bashing on Demi Lovato because she's drinking and smoking pot. And, you know, it's like, California sober is just smoking pot. It's not drinking. So, I mean, she's like, that's the thing that's closest. And everyone in the recovery community is like on her ass about it. And it's like, she's 28 fucking years old. Let her find her fucking path. I had to. I had to go, well, I can't do meth, but I can do this. And I did that until I figured out I couldn't do anything. Maybe she can do that. Who do, well, it's not, we don't know. My concern is that she had three strokes and a fucking heart attack. And I think maybe she should just chill on <laughs> You know, I looked it up and it's like you should have one glass of wine a day if you've had a stroke. So my concern is more like a health related, not so addiction. You you have to find your way and everyone's way is different. I know people who shoot heroin who can drink occasionally. Good for them. I know yeah. people who are alcoholics who can do psychedelics. Yay. Like it's as individual as your thumbprint, as my as my co-host says, addiction. And so should be, so, so should recovery be. So I think that we really need to throw out the fundamentalism and be inclusive. Yeah, and that's why it could also be so hard to find out where to start or what to do because if you feel like, okay, that worked for her, that but that might not work for me. So everything is like a Yeah, uh, there's no magic pill. I mean, everyone's addiction is <laughs> different, and that's why I've been in seven rehab. Like, you know, everyone goes, well, this is, you know, the magic pill and every, everyone wants like the cure, but there is no cure for everyone because everyone's totally different. You know, a works for some people. It doesn't work for a lot of people. A lot of people just grow out of their addiction. Like, you know, they get married, they have a baby and then they stop using because they're pregnant and then they never use again. 
You know, everyone's fucking different. Some people do Ibogaine and have that shift. Like, I think of what Ibogaine psychedelics create is that shift that I had sweeping the streets. Yeah. Which is that psychic shift where you see things from a different perspective and you get out of the prison that is, and the possession that is addiction, where your brain is hijacked and you fucking, it is like, it's your survival to get high and whatever. And you see it from another perspective and that's what frees you to do something different. And so if you need a psychedelic to fucking do that, rock it out. Like I had to fucking sweep poo to have that. I would have preferred a psychedelic than sweeping poo for fucking a year and a half. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, you know, I mean, why I had that epiphany, I have no idea. It's just a gift. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, so yeah, I, I, I think, I think that you, know, you have to try different things to figure out what works for you. And that's the hard part. We don't know enough about addiction to know, Oh, you, this will work for you. Even with medications, <laughs> yeah. you can take a fucking test and they'll say this medication will probably work for you. But still, my experience with antidepressants was, you know, trying different things. It didn't work. The, trying another one, it didn't work. Or it worked for a while and then it stopped working and blah, blah. Same with, with my epilepsy meds. It's, you know, like everyone was like, you know, like, like pot worked for a lot of people. Yeah. And I was like, cool. CBD, I was about to ask you. Did not work. I tried it and did not fucking do a fucking thing. And I couldn't even tolerate most epilepsy medications. And now I'm on like phenobarbital, which is like what most like people's epileptic dogs are on. Like when I go pick it up at the pharmacy, people are like, this is for you. I'm like, yep. <laughs> it's like, for, like, it's like, oh, it's like, it's like what Elvis died of. Elvis died of like that. Marilyn Monroe, Judy Garland, mixing with booze. Wow. Um, and I'm on Klonopin and people were like, well, you're not sober if you're on Klonopin. I'm like, well, you know what? I don't want to live my life wearing a helmet. So go fuck yourself. And I don't abuse it and I don't even feel it. So, you know, I mean, I out of van, I can't take Advan puts me in a blackout and I kick over chairs and tell people I'm a princess and try and fuck everyone. So it's like out of van's not an option. Like I know it's not an option. Oxy makes me stab people. Like we got it. Like, we're, yeah, we're learning. We've been there. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that it's really important to have an open mind and try different things and not stop. I think it's important to really to not have shame around it. I think that it's a it's either from trauma or biology or both. And although it's not your fault, it is your responsibility to fix it. And I think that there's nothing to be ashamed of. I think there's a big stigma, and I, I don't really understand why. Um, I don't have, feel ashamed about it at all. And I think that um, it's really important. Shame lowers your dopamine, and that makes you more prone to seek out dopamine, which is like what you get from sex, attention, cigarettes, candy, whatever. And it's so for me, I just was like, fuck shame. You know what? I, I, I forgave myself and shame is, was never helpful to me. It only made me relapse over and over and over again. And so I just feel like, you know, I own my stuff. Yeah. Fuck shame in and general. When you own it. You're yeah. sort of, you're sort of, uh, you're sort of bulletproof when you own it all. And say like I did all this. What's anyone gonna say? You tried to stab your ex. Like I wrote a book about it, bitch. What else you got? You know. <laughs> yeah. There is a power to owning it, and I'm not saying I'm proud of what I did, but I'm not. I I refuse to be ashamed of it. Like I did the best I could at the time with the tools I had. I was very mentally ill, and extremely in my addiction, and I'm not that person now. It's eight years later. I've done a lot of internal work. Yeah, and so LA, right? Yeah. <laughs> Done so much internal work and like worked on my chakras and aligned my chakras and like no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and and thank you, thank you for utilizing all those experiences to help and to shed light on this stigma and really breaking down those walls because the way you approach it is like how could could there be a stigma when someone's so honest and so upfront about it? So I appreciate it a lot. Of course. Yeah, that was my hope was breaking the stigma. Like I was like, okay, you want to live through, I want to take you through a story and you're going to live in my brain and body through my book. First person, you're going to, I'm going to strap you in and you're going to fucking learn what it feel like, what it's like to be an addict. And people are like, holy fuck. Like they just were like, I have empathy now for addicts. I understand now. Like I get it. It's like, you know, I want to bring you into my brain for a fucking a little while and then you'll get it. And so you know, I don't really get why it's like, I really, really, 
it wasn't something I chose. And when you can feel the physical part of it, like I did, like the second time I did meth, when it just clicked, like a vacuum opened up. I can feel that with cigarettes. I can feel that with sex and I can feel that with love. Like I literally like my biology changes. And it's like, I really do think that there's, there's, it, you know, we're finding out more and more that it's a brain chemistry thing. So why would I be ashamed of it? Yeah. It's like, it's just the cards I was dealt. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know. There's the coolest people, the coolest artists and singers and writers and we're drug addicts and alcoholics. Like we're kind of cool people. Like <laughs> we've done some cool shit. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. 